Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Exit Strategies, Preparing Your Manufacturing Business for a Transfer of Ownership. A few housekeeping items that I'll mention before we get started today. If you have questions during the session, you can type those in the questions section. If you'll just hover over the bottom of the webinar screen, you should see the Q&A section, and you can type those in there at the conclusion of the webinar We'll have a session um, where we will go through those questions. In addition, there's also a chat function within Zoom. Uh, if you hover over the bottom again there, that's one of the other functions there. If you have any kind of technical issues or any other items that you need to chat with our team about today during the webinar, you can also use that function. Okay, today's webinars will be presented by partners from Car Rigs and Ingram, as well as CRI Capital Advisors. My name is Kathy Dover, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm a partner in the Birmingham office of Car Rigs and Ingram. I have over 18 years of public accounting experience in a range of different industries, including the manufacturing and distribution industry. I provided a variety of services ranging from the standard external audit and tax services to consulting, internal audit, and SOX control testing to clients of all sizes. We're also excited to have with us Paul Evans. Paul is a partner and the Director of Client Relations for our CRI Capital Advisors. He co-founded Genesis Business Group, which merged with CRI in 2010. Paul combines more than 30 years of tried and true business ownership when initially meeting with clients to determine their needs. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management and is a certified value builder. Paul has also been the owner or partner in seven businesses over the last 30 years. Joining Paul will be Brandon Maddox. Brandon is a partner and the director of operations for CRI Capital Advisors. Brandon organizes and oversees every critical detail of a transaction from engagement through the closing. He has a bachelor's of science in business administration and in software engineering, and he is a Series 79 licensed investment banking representative. CRI Capital Advisors is a registered broker dealer with a Securities Exchange Commission. We are members of FINRA and SIPC. The team is comprised of registered investment banking professionals. Okay, to get us started and to learn more about the types of industries that are represented by the participants in today's call, um, we ask that you'll just type in your manufacturing industry in the chat box. Again, you can just hover over the bottom of the screen there and the function should appear. If you'll just click on that chat function and type in the name of the, or the type of industry that you are in uh, so that we have an idea of who all is participating in the call today. Now I'll turn it over to you, Paul, to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, with today's agenda, what we're going to be looking at is, is several facets. Uh, number one is manufacturing interest. You know, why is M&A interested in manufacturing? And we're going to cover seven reasons for that. Second, we're going to look at market activity, which is always critical from the standpoint of understanding just how active acquisitions, mergers are right now. Three, multiple ranges by size of industry. Number four, your exit options. Often we think there's only 100% exit and that's it, but there's several other options available. Number five, the impact of COVID in the manufacturing industries. Number six, the exit timeline. It's not quite as simple as getting out there and selling your business in the next month, as most of you know, but we'll give you the, the typical timeline and what that involves. And then finally, we'll talk about a market value assessment, how to determine the actual value of your company in today's market. We've got a lot of different industries that are represented today. We've got lumber, trading and distribution, fire logs, re refrigeration products, printing, mining, energy, distribution and manufacturing, computer networking, uh, and general printing we've got as well. So, you know, great that you guys came out. There are a lot of other industries that are represented as well, but that's always an important aspect is just to be able to know that we're meeting the right need and having the right conversation. So let's begin, Kathy, with our first poll question. Okay, great. We're going to start with our first question here. And this question is, where are you in the exit process? So I'm going to get ready to launch this poll question. I'll give you all a few seconds to 
log your answers there uh, where you are in the exit process. Those votes are coming in quickly there. Give it just a few more seconds <clears throat> before I end the poll. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results. And it looks like the majority, 48%, are in the five plus years out, followed by 21% in one to two years out. You know, and that's super helpful because when we're looking at exit, the great thing is, is it doesn't matter if you're a year or two out or five years out, we love to walk alongside companies and business owners uh, so that we're making sure that their needs are met. And they're also growing at the right type of value. If you're currently in uh, exit transition or entertaining offers, we're happy to have a call, free consulting call, just to discuss where you are and to make sure that you feel comfortable in the path that you're on. Uh, as we mentioned, we're going to begin with M&A manufacturing interest. This is one of the few industries that regardless of what's going on economically, what's happening in the world at large, it tends to stay fairly strong when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. There's really seven reasons for that. Brendan, lead us through these and why you feel like they're important. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So, you know, as we're looking at interest and in, in looking at M&A in general, we try to really get into the mind of, of a buyer or an investor and, and try to look at things through their lens and understand what's important, important to them. And I would say an overarching theme is going to be risk for a buyer. Um, they, they love to buy into industries that they can either understand the risk or control the risk or minimize that risk. So a lot of these will have that common theme. So let's start up at the top left. So historical stability, um, you know, and this is true in more than just manufacturing, but especially in manufacturing. If, if you've got, um, you know, a period of years, um, call it five, six, seven, 10 years under which you have been either, you know, consistently profitable, revenue's been growing, uh, you have a nice growth track that's going to be of interest. And we see a lot of that in manufacturing, just that steady, consistent year after year, uh, just continuing to, to perform. And as Paul mentioned, you know, um, sometimes regardless of what's happening in outside forces, obviously there's some impact here and there, um, but, but manufacturing seems to be a little bit more stable than some. Um, and then just the, the, uh, the idea of manufacturing as it relates to what you're producing. So anytime you're creating something, anytime you're making something tangible, um, that, that a buyer can hold, they can understand, um, you're going to get some additional interest there. Um, sometimes with service companies um, uh, that are not, you know, necessarily making an end product, it can be a little bit tougher for a buyer to get their hands around. Um, there's definitely plenty out there that look at service companies, and we, we have a good bit of activity there as well. But as far as manufacturing goes, they really just like to have something, uh, have a business that's creating something, that's making something, that's contributing something, a physical um, product. Uh, pivot strength, this, this actually goes to a point that Paul will cover a little bit more when we get into the um, discussion on COVID and its impact. But we've seen um, a lot of flexibility when it relates to manufacturing companies. You know, maybe I'm making uh, one product and that product for whatever reason um, you know, goes out of favor or is more expensive to purchase or, or customers are not as interested as they used to be. Um, and, and manufacturers often are able to, to pivot. They, they know how to make things. And, and this, you know, maybe the thing that they're making now goes out of style or is, is less profitable than it used to be. Well, I'm, I'm not going to shut down. A lot of times we see them shift into something else, um, you know, really nimble, really light on their feet. Um, and, and that can be of great interest to buyers as well. Um, these next two, non-durable non and heavy machinery, go to really two sides of the same coin. So non-durable, um, think about products that are, um, are going to wear out, that are going to have to be purchased more than once. Uh, investors and buyers are always interested in that repeat business and that customer that buys from me once and has to come back and do so again later. So very interesting dynamic of some manufacturers there. And on the flip side of that coin is heavy machinery. Think about products or, or heavy um, pieces of equipment that, that really get made once and then they get serviced over a period of 50, 60 years sometimes with some of this heavy machinery. Um, there's that service element. There's that piece. There's that recurring element that comes in that, 
that yeah, I've got I've got a sale on day one, but over the over the lifetime of that product, I get to sell you parts that go into that. I get to sell you um, service that goes along with that. Those are really interesting dynamics from a buyer's perspective. Um, again, to the longevity, um, you know, a lot of manufacturers that we've worked with over the years, they've been around for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and just the, just the sheer amount of time that's passed and the fact that you are, you as a manufacturer have been able to consistently, one, make the product, but two, find customers. Those customers come back to you time and time again. You're able to gain new business. Um, that spread out over time is extremely appealing to an investor. And then complexity. This goes really to uh, defensible positions, to niche markets. Um, if, you know, a lot of times manufacturing is not, um, you know, not just anyone can come in on day one and replicate what you're doing. You've got some know-how, you've got some industry knowledge, um, and, and you're able to capitalize on that in your manufacturing processes. So it's to the extent that you've got that kind of niche on the market or that you have that defensible position, that's really of interest to potential buyers. You know, I love that phrase, Brandon, defensible position, because that goes all the way back to, to risk and that you're bringing something specialized to the table. So as you look over these seven attributes, think about the ones that you feel completely aligned with. Maybe historically, not only does manufacturing have a lot of stability, but we talk with a lot of owners who say, you know, I've been in this business 25 years, or maybe it's second or third generation, and you've got that stability through those decades. Or perhaps over the period of COVID, you had to pivot. And so that becomes part of your narrative as well. So as you look at these seven, you don't have to have all seven, obviously. Uh, but if you've got two or three that you feel especially strong in and they are defendable, that's going to put you in a great position when it comes time to sell. When we're looking at market activity, we're really talking about how many transactions are taking place. Is there a down cycle? If we're looking at something along the lines of construction, obviously, there are ebbs and flows to that. And if market activity is high, uh, selling and buying is high, then we're able to say, yep, yeah, it's a good time to go to market because there's a lot of activity. Other times, the, the activity can be extremely low and it's not a great time. The great thing about manufacturing is that transactions seem to be happening very regularly. And so I've just listed 20 right here out of over 2,900 transactions that took place in the past year. Now, this includes uh, private companies and also public companies. And when you get into that lane, there's uh, once it's public, then it's going to be able to uh, have the information being made public no matter what. And so when we're using something like this that you see on the screen, this is from PitchBook, and you see company financing status, there's private equity, there's corporate back, it's often called strategic. One of the big moves that we've seen recently is that in the past, if it was strategic, it was just that company that had the resources, but now we're seeing a lot of private equity that is that are backing strategic companies. That's kind of been a shift in what, last 10, 15 years, especially, Brandon? Yeah, that's right. You know, so when we're looking at that, it doesn't mean that if you go strategic, it's necessarily just that company. There could be some private equity money behind it. And speaking of private equity money, I think we're up to $1.7 trillion in committed capital. These aren't search funds. They're not those who are having to go out and raise the money once they're wanting to, to have an acquisition. But there's that money that's out there waiting to be deployed. And so when we look at market activity, there's a lot of activity in manufacturing right now. We're not ones to say, hey, now's the time to move because the activity is high. Activity tends to stay fairly, fairly stable, uh, even though there is some ebb and flow. But we're always happy to be a resource for you. You're, you're more than welcome to contact us and say, hey, what's market activity looking like in this specific industry? We'll hit this again a little bit later when we're talking about uh, multiples. But we need to consider as well, when you're thinking about manufacturing, it's very broad. Uh, there are at least resources that we're able to tap into. We can access 194 different reports because they've got that many different segments of manufacturing that they report on. So if you want to know more activity that's happening within your specific industry, we're more than happy uh, to speak with you about that. Now, speaking of multiple ranges, we're looking at this by size because that does have a little bit of an impact. So, Brennan, when it comes to multiples in overall manufacturing, talk to us about this chart and also why size is a factor. Yeah, sure. And, 
you know, this this is a lot of information on this chart. So let me, let me break it down just a little bit. And and this, you know, Paul mentioned on the previous slide that was a mix of public public and private companies. These transactions that are represented here are just private companies. And as you know, private companies are not, they don't have to report anything. So this is really kind of a self-reporting. So this is not a full um, a full you know, measure of all the private companies that were sold in this time frame, but really just the ones who were inclined to report for one reason or another. Um, but yeah, size plays a huge role. So if we look in the column for 2020, the most recent year reported here, you've got a range in multiples, and, and the, this is a multiple of EBITDA. So you've, you know, think about um, uh, basically earnings, and we'll get into a little bit more about how we calculate um, what EBITDA looks like as far as we're concerned in these transactions, but you, you're going to place some multiple upon EBITDA of your company. And the range in 2020 was 5.9 to 7.4. And you may be thinking, okay, that's pretty good. I like that 7.4 number. Let's just go with that one. Um, but if you look all the way on the left, you see TEV as total enterprise value. So um, it, it's a huge difference between company, you know, smaller co companies versus larger companies as far as what multiple you're going to be able to, to achieve. A uh, smaller company is, is just going to get a smaller multiple. That's just, that's just how the investors are working. Uh, and the inverse of that, you know, larger company, larger multiple. In addition to that, this is just general, I mean, this is all manufacturing all rolled into one. So if you're manufacturing a fairly common product, not to say it's easy to manufacture, but a fairly common product, um, that, that's going to that's gonna have one multiple assigned to it. Let's say that you're manufacturing a specialty uh, part for a highly um, toleranced medical device, that's going to be a completely different multiple. And you really can't say, oh, well, this manufacturing sold for X multiple, I should be able to get the same thing. It doesn't work exactly like that. There's a little bit more nuance. And some of that's based on size. Some of that is based on what type of manufacturing that you're doing. You know, and tying in again, that we're more than happy to help you discover your multiple uh, if you'd like to reach out on that as well. And there'll be some information at the end to be able to do that. Thinking about exit options, as I mentioned earlier, often people think, well, I, I'm not ready to sell yet because I'm not ready to retire. But that's not the only option. Brandon, again, runs our process here. and He's going to take us through the 100 percent exit and also the majority or the minority recap. Yeah, so um, starting at the top, 100% exit, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. So think about, um, you know, you coming to an agreement with a potential buyer and you sell 100% of the company on day one and, and you essentially walk away after, a, you know, maybe a 60-day transition period. We see this happen uh, really in a couple of different instances. So one is when there's a strategic acquire. So think about another company in the space who, who says, yeah, I want to roll what you're doing into what I'm doing and just really take over operations on day one. You either find that or, as Paul mentioned before, let's say a private equity group, they already own a company in the space and they're going to acquire you on behalf of that other company and really do the same thing. They're just going to take over operations on day one. Um, the key here is that the investor has got to have an operator or an operations team already in place in order to make that happen. And we do see it happen. It's not, it's not that it um, it's, doesn't happen at all. It's just that's not as common as, as one might think. Um, you know, some other things to think about, you know, does, does that potential strategic company have some type of a, of a synergy that they can realize on day one? You know, are, are they making a complementary product? Are they making the same product? Are they, are they selling into different geographies? Um, you know, think about different pieces that maybe they fill or you fill uh, and the other one doesn't. Um, you know, some type of synergy there is really going to make that 100% exit um, you know, possible, in addition to, like I say, going ahead and having those operations teams in place. Um, the one that we actually see more of, especially when um, potential sellers, our clients find out about the options, this one actually tends to be a little bit more attractive most of the time. And it's the, it's the recap scenario. So basically how this happens, and it, and it can be majority or minority, it really works the same way. Majority, obviously, you're selling the, the majority of your company, you know, 51% uh, plus minority is on the, you know, the other side of that. Um, and we've got investors that we work with that, that like both sides of that. And there's, there's reasons for that. 
Um, you know, it really just depends on how the fund is set up that they're working from. <clears throat> but the recap piece is interesting. So I'm going to, let's say I sell 60% of my company today <clears throat> and I hold 40% of it. Um, well, eventually this private equity company is going to sell this again. They're, they're typically going to take my company and they're going to roll it into something they already hold or, they're, or maybe they have a strategy under which they're saying, hey, I'm going to buy you and I'm going to buy you know, your top 10 competitors over the next five years and I'm going to integrate these and we're going to get, you know, we're going to be firing on all cylinders and then I'm going to sell it to a larger private equity company. Well, I, I own 40% of this entity and when when that private equity company sells again, it's called the second bite of the apple. And essentially you, you get to sell your company twice. You get paid for the first time. And then a lot of times that second, um, second round sell ends up being more money than the first round sell. Um, so, you know, some interesting dynamics at play there. Um, you know, we see the recap happen a lot with, you know, someone who's looking for a partner. They're not looking necessarily to sell everything. They're just saying, hey, I've gone as far as I can go. I'd really like to find someone else who can help me, you know, expand or grow to a level that I've not been able to by myself. Um, you know, think advisory board seats after the fact. Um, think about capital, um, you know, money in addition to what's invested to purchase the company. Think about additional money that's available after the fact. So maybe they purchase you for one price, but you've got growth plans. You're saying, hey, I want to expand into this. I want to I want to also, you know, manufacture this product or I've got this machinery that's going to help efficiencies. You, you get to do those things on their dime instead of you going, you know, into debt personally and signing, you know, notes um, and guarantees on that thing. So, um, you know, an interesting option that, that a lot of people haven't thought about before. We had a great success story with this recently. Uh, one of our clients, a young guy, and often when it comes to selling next, that people think, well, it's, it's after I'm 65 or 70 or maybe I'm in my 80s. This guy was in his mid 40s. Uh, and felt like he really wanted to expand. All the financial pressure was on him. He was just located in Florida, and he was like, I'd love to go to other states, but uh, I'm just scared to take the financial risk, and I'm not exactly sure how to set things up and expand into these other states. We found a great partner for him. Uh, they were really a great fit, and he was able to exit with a good, good chunk of change, uh, put in his pocket for himself and his family, and within about nine months, he was in eight additional states. And that's what that private equity partner did for him. So if you're in that growth mindset, if you're thinking, you know what, I'm not even close to retirement. I feel like I've got a ton of years left. That may be something for you to consider if you feel like, you know, I've grown it to X amount. I really believe that it could be Y but I need a partner to help me get there. Something to consider on that front. And the final aspect is legacy. And that could be that you feel like, well, I'm going to leave my, my business to my kids or I've got a great management team. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that. The aspect that you'd want to talk to your advisor about is do you feel 100% confident that if you're looking for a financial exit, if you're looking for your future financially and it's tied to that, then it may be that you want to consider, again, a majority or a minority recap from the standpoint of go ahead and get your money out and allow the company uh, to take the risk instead of you taking that risk. So that's something to consider as well. The impact of COVID. So it's obviously been an interesting year. And some of the things that we've seen in manufacturing, especially, is just massive pivots. Uh, one of the most interesting among, among one of our clients was uh, a gentleman, his team that manufactured food equipment. And then once they saw COVID hit, they went into manufacturing uh, sanitation equipment, uh, whether it was stands uh, for sanitation holders or if it was plastic to go between booths within a restaurant, they made a quick shift uh, because they make things, as Brandon mentioned earlier, and were able to make that relatively quickly. So that's one of the things that we saw most of all in the manufacturing industry. The other two aspects, healthcare and medical went through the roof. Anybody who was doing manufacturing in that certainly saw a surge and saw an increase in orders, saw an increase in impact overall, even in the, the uh, amount of the lives that they were affecting. Uh, packaging and plastics also extremely huge, certainly as e-commerce was boosted, more people are getting things delivered to their home. I'm not sure we're going to the grocery store again because we've started having delivery in there of everything. And once that coming to the house in, it's coming to the house in packaging. 
and it's increased even more. Amazon packaging has increased, home deliveries have increased, and we've seen that shift as well. And certainly you guys are on the front lines. Uh, you know exactly how it's impacted your business. You know the, the adjustments that have been made. But what we're also seeing the impact of COVID that's been unusual is this time last year, investors felt like, man, now's the time to get a great deal. Multiples are just going to get depressed. We're going to be able to get out there and just buy everything up. And what they found was that businesses, especially manufacturing that did well during COVID, the multiples didn't change. And even now they've crept up. And then the companies that did not survive COVID were not still in distress. They were actually out of business and they didn't find the deals they were looking for. So it was an interesting time investment wise. And now we're finding that a lot are, are playing catch up because they feel like they basically missed about a year of investing. And we find that multiples are, are even higher than they were at this time last year across the board, even though that's a general statement, but we've been kind of surprised by that. Brandon, as you've talked to groups out there do you find that they're pretty anxious to invest? They're still going to be wise, but it seems like they're they're moving at a little quicker pace than usual. Yeah, I think so. There's a lot of eagerness out there. As Paul mentioned, they just didn't get to invest on the level that they were anticipating in 2020. And that doesn't mean they're going to purchase companies that don't make sense for them, but there's just so much money out there. And the way these private equity groups work, you, you, I'm sure you're all aware of this, they don't actually get paid any management fees on this money. They don't actually get it doesn't do them any good as a company until they deploy that money. So yeah, there's there's well over a trillion dollars that's out there to be invested. They don't actually get the full benefit of that unless they actually go invest it. So um, there's just a lot of pent up demand. And there again, doesn't mean they're going to purchase things that don't make sense, but there's a ton of activity and a ton of groups that are out there looking and seeking for good businesses. We'll shift the lane a little bit and talk about the exit timeline, whether you're looking at a five year plus exit plan or, or you're a year away. This is the basic route that it takes. Usually I'm on the front end. We're going to talk about the assessment here in just a minute and how to get one done for you. But Brandon, talk through this 180 to 360 days and what that entails and what they can expect. Yeah. So starting on the left, you know, with the assessment, obviously, Paul said he'll he'll take care of that. You know, after that, assuming we come to some agreement on what we think about value, what you're looking for, um, you know, we'll kind of go from there. And we've got all the typical paperwork that you would expect, you know, engagements, um, NDAs, um, all of that's fully taken care of before we get started. But then we'll move into a process of underwriting. And really, underwriting is allowing us to get a better understanding of your company. Think from a financial, operational, um, customer, um, product standpoint, just really understanding the ins and outs. And, and we've done this long enough to know the questions that buyers are going to ask. So we try to get most of those out of the way up front. Um, from there, we'll, we'll put together a book, we'll put together a package, and it's really just an overview summary of your company, um, comes along with financial exhibits that we put together, and then we go out to market. And that looks a couple of different ways, depending on what the, the end goal is, but essentially we are in a confidential way contacting buyers on your behalf. Um, they won't know who you are, won't know where you are, basically they'll know just generally what you do, um, a size range of, of kind of, you know, what you've been able to do uh, revenue and earnings wise. Um, if they're interested beyond that, they have to sign um, an NDA. We keep those on file and then they get to review that summary package. We're going to take care of the first few calls, uh, first few back and forth conversations to make sure that they're serious. And we narrow down our, um, you know, initial search list down to just a handful, really, that want to have conversations with, with you, the owner. Um, they're going to ask you all the same questions that we've already answered for them more likely than not, but there's something about hearing it from the person who owns the company, from the person who's running the company. Um, from there, assuming we, we get an offer on the table that's uh, agreeable to everyone, we'll move into a period of diligence. Uh, and that, it, it's a lot, it looks a lot like underwriting, but really to a greater extent, um, they're, they're going to pull in legal teams, they're going to pull in um, some deeper level financial analysis as well. They're going to look at insurance benefits. There again, every angle of the business to try to just make sure they understand what they're, what they're you know, proposing to, to buy from you. 
uh, from there, uh, along the same time timeline, really in a parallel effort, um, a purchase agreement will start being negotiated. This, this will be when you need to have an attorney on your side. We're not attorneys. Um, happy for you to use uh, an attorney of your choosing. The only um, advice I would give you is to, is to pick one that has M&A experience. Uh, you'll save yourself a lot of time and honestly, a lot of money. Um, and and you'll, you'll get a better result at the end of the day if you've got somebody who's gone through this process before. Uh, but really from purchase agreement on, we're, we're moving every day to closing. Um, and, you know, I will mention too, you're not really locked into doing anything with a buyer until you sign that purchase agreement. So there'll, there'll be some documents. There's a letter of intent before that can be an indication of interest. Uh, a lot of paperwork going back and forth, but really you're not, you're not saying I will absolutely do this deal until you sign on that final day. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. You, you really do have freedom to, to move and negotiate and, and, and to kind of work through it. It's a, it's a big process and that's what we're here to help uh, with. Great overview on that, Brandon. And guys, if you would like a copy of this sheet, uh, go down to the chat area. If you'll just hover over the buttons at the bottom and go to the chat box and just type in the word timeline and we'll be sure to send you a copy. Just type in timeline. So the market assessment, often people want to know how much their company is worth, and it's a great question, and there's a couple of ways to look at that. Number one is, is a technical sense, and that's not what we do. Your CPA and other professionals uh, can help you with the business valuation. That's a technical valuation. It's usually used in a, a legal sense. Perhaps there's a dispute with a business partner. Uh, perhaps you've got uh, a challenge in your, your marriage, unfortunately, and, and they, there may be a, a pending divorce and there's going to be some things divided up. And so that business valuation, the technical valuation may be useful at that time. However, what we focus on is the market assessment. So this is an estimated transaction price range. And what we mean by that is this is not what your company is going to finally sell for, but it is a range of the types of offers that you can expect to hear when you go to market. So we do this on the front end. That way, if you feel comfortable about the range, you can go, yep, let's go to market. Let's, let's try to sell this. Or you may say, I'm worth so much more than that. It's, it's not even going to be worth it if I can't get more than that number. Uh, and we're happy to do uh, an assessment for you. So there's a couple of aspects to this. There's a science side, which Brandon's going to talk about in just a second. And that's the, the numbers piece. And then there's also the art side, because just because a business is doing well does not mean it's going to receive the highest multiple. It could you know, have to dive into what's the uh, the customer range that you have. What's your largest customer? What uh, what amount of activity are you placing within the business? Is it owner dependent or owner independent? Are you able to take off for six weeks and then not really skip a beat? Do you have a great management team in place? So some of these art pieces that don't show up on your balance sheet, don't show up on your P&L, but certainly are important to buyers. So we've got seven elements, seven drivers of value that we look at when we're doing an assessment. However, from the, the financial side, which is also important in the right side of this slide, you'll see a sheet, the summary of market value. This is what we produce when we're doing a value assessment so that you can get some feedback on the numbers. And there's really five elements to this. So Brandon, talk to us about these five on the left side. Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, we're, we're gonna get all of your financials and a lot of times in manufacturing, um, construction similar to this as well, you know, we're looking at more of a range um, over a period of years. So let's say that this past year was the best year you've ever had and it looks unlike anything you've ever done before or, the opposite. This is the worst year you've ever had. And, and my goodness, you hope you never have another one of those again. Um, that's not what value is going to be placed on solely. They're more likely than not going to look at a three-year average, maybe even a five-year average, depending on how your business is, has performed over those years. To um, so, so we're starting from that point. So we start with net income, and then we're going to move into EBITDA. And it's not just the traditional calculation of EBITDA, which is you know earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, sure, that's where we start. But then we actually go in and do what we call normalizing or um, truing up in some way. And what we're doing is we're taking, let's say, um, you know, let's say a normal executive in, in your industry gets paid $200,000 a year, um, but it's your business. So you're pay, you pay yourself $800,000 a year. Uh, well, obviously there's some normalizing to be done there. And 
that's just one example. It could be that you've got a family member who's on payroll that really, yeah, yeah, they come in the office, but maybe they're not working full time. Or maybe you've got um, a second home and that's running through the business. Uh, from, from our side, and we're not in the capital advisors um, company, we're not CPAs. We rely heavily on the CPA firm that we're a part of. Um, but we don't necessarily care from the standpoint of a financial situation, how much is running through the company. We need to know as much of that as we can, because every dollar that we can add back to EBITDA, that multiple that we've assigned gets applied to that. And that's just dollars in your pocket. So first step is normalized EBITDA. We'll try to try to get that nailed down as tightly as we can. Uh, part of the calculation, too, is going to be networking capital. And that's just at a, at a high level, you know, current assets minus current liabilities gives kind of a networking capital calculation. That's going to come into effect when, when we start negotiating a deal. Um, also, most deals that we work with are on a cash-free, debt-free basis. So if you've got excess, quote unquote, excess cash on the balance sheet, um, that gets netted out against any debt that you've got. Being manufacturing companies, a lot of times we see a decent amount of debt on a company. Most buyers are going to want to purchase your company debt free. So if you've got a million dollar um, loan out on a piece of equipment that you bought five years ago, we, that's going to be paid off. Um, but let's say you've got $3 million of excess cash sitting in the checking account. Well, okay, let's do the math. Two minus you know, uh, or three minus one, you know, two, that's $2 million additional capital that gets put in your pocket at the closing table. So um, just something to keep in mind there on that equation. And then these last two are really just more structural elements. So, you know, typically we like to look for um, some, some words around continued involvement. So yeah, you're going to sell your company. Are they going to expect you to be there for the next five years? Do they want a shorter transition period? Do they need a transition period at all? Uh, we sold one here just recently, a company, and it was it was a 60 day transition. It was really just, um, you know, I, I need to know where everything's at. And then after that, you don't have to be around anymore. We've seen them gone go much longer than that, too. And, and that can be negotiated. And then, you know, just understanding the time frame for diligence and closing as well. Uh, and that goes back to the to the timeline that we spoke to earlier. Think about once we have an offer on the table and we've agreed to it, kind of that 90 to 120 day um, window from signing of a letter of intent to closing. So really just a high level overview of what you could potentially expect in the form of offer, in the form of structure, um, you know, if you were to go to market. So as you see in this example to the right, uh, at the EBITDA that's on the page, you've got a multiple here of four to four point two five. We do a fairly narrow multiple. Uh, there's a lot of groups out there that will come in. And in fact, we were talking to somebody last week that said, I heard my, my multiple was between a four and a nine. Well, that's a really broad range. Uh, and most of the time that said so that you'll think nine and, and <laughs> sign an engagement rather relatively quickly. But what we're going to do is do a really tight range for you so you can know exactly what to expect. And as far as deal size, we work with companies of all sizes. We've got deals right now uh, that are around that $2 million range. We've got one that looks like it's going to be around $200 million range. Uh, so we feel like we've got a team to work with you where you are to help you get to where you want to go. Uh, we're going to go now to another poll question, and it's around the market assessment to see if you would like one. Okay, so I'll get ready to launch the next poll question here. Get that launched. This poll question is, would you like a complimentary market assessment? You can answer yes, maybe in a few months, or I'd like to speak to CRI Capital Advisors about selling. Give everyone a few minutes to log your answers here in this uh, poll question. A couple more coming in right now. We'll let those get in, then I'll end the polling question. I'll end that and we will keep those results there. Um, those of you that have said yes, and uh, maybe in a few months, we will log that information. Thank you very much for participating in the poll question. Great, thank you. 
Uh, if you would also like to go ahead and get your assessment, we've got a QR code for those of you who are technical. Uh, and we've got the, the uh, instructions right here on the screen. Line up your smartphone camera on your device with a QR code uh, that you want to scan. Hold the device steady until the app reads the code and it'll guide you to the center of your code, and then a URL will appear. It'll take you online, and there'll be a very brief form to fill out, and we'll receive that as well and be able to be in contact with you. I'll give that just a few more seconds to keep that up, because this is one of those things, Brandon, you either know how to use or you don't. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> but we certainly appreciate everyone who was able to click that, and we look forward to serving you and working with you. So we also want to spend a few minutes taking some questions, Kathy. Okay, great. So if you have any questions, uh, just a reminder, you can type those in the Q&A section there if you hover over the bottom of the screen, and I'll get started on those that we have received. Um, can you discuss the networking capital adjustment that buyers may want to make sure that there is sufficient cash and AR left in the business to fund operations for some negotiated period of time? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, and this, you know, this is one of those elements that, you know, on the surface seems fairly simple, but when we've just seen it go so many different ways. Um, so, yeah, you, you're exactly right. So think, think about think about it from this angle. Um, a buyer doesn't want to come in on day one and have to uh, put additional capital into a company to, let's say, make payroll or something like that. Um, they're not looking to win in this calculation, though. They're not looking to extract additional value. So we, we typically take the working capital um, calculation and we run that back for a period of months. And we've seen, um, you know, we've seen three months, six months, 12 months. It, it just it depends on the buyer and it depends on how the company typically cycles. Um, so, you know, at, at ideally at the closing table, it's a break even. But typically how that works is um, if there's an excess of networking capital, that's going to come back to you, the seller. If there's a deficiency there, then additional monies are going to go over to the buyer. But at the end of the day, if, if we've done our homework, um, then, then that, that's going to essentially net out to, to zero. Um, hope, that, hope that answers. It's a fairly complex question. I'm happy to, to have a kind of a separate call on that as well if, if you want. Okay, great. Um, what are the pros and cons of using an M&A firm that specializes in your industry? That's another great question. And there are pros and cons. The pro side, obviously, is they know the space extremely well. They're going to know a lot of the value propositions and feel that because they intricately know the industry, that they're going to be able to place it well. They're going to know who the players are uh, so that they can approach them. I uh, would also say that that could be a con from the standpoint of if they know the players, are they reaching out to those who could be possible buyers and may even buy at a higher level? They're just not aware of them. So they may very well know the strategic players, but may not know the private equity players. So those are really the questions that you have to ask. And we get asked that a lot. We spend a lot of time in manufacturing. We spend a lot of time in food. But also, we've closed a lot of deals in industries that we've really got no background in because we know that the owner is the one who is the true expert in the industry. And our job is to get the best deal possible. Here's a quick example. We sold a food manufacturer a little over a year ago, and they told us right off the bat, we know who the buyer is going to be. It's going to be one of these top three. And they were absolutely strong in the industry. They were right about that. These companies were industry experts and they had the means to do the deal. However, we felt like, okay, we may not be the experts in this particular segment of the industry, but we do know a lot of groups who would be interested. We went to market. Turns out that those three that they felt really were the buyers weren't even in the top 10. And ultimately, uh, the buyer was a group that they'd never heard of, and they outperformed everybody else by, I think, a multiple, maybe 1.5. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right, Brandon? Yeah. So that was really interesting. So there are a lot of pros from the standpoint of they really do know the industry well. The con could be they may be relying too much on previous knowledge and not doing a lot of work from scratch to make sure they're bringing the best buyer. 
Great. Um, another question that's come in, uh, do you see a major difference between special purpose acquisition companies and private equity buyers? Yeah, that's a great question again. So, you, I mean, y'all are just knocking them out of the park here. <laughs> good. Um, no, so we, you know, we see a lot of activity from a news standpoint on SPACs. Honestly, we haven't run across that a ton in investors that are coming to the table to acquire companies that we're looking at. So, when we think about the ones that we see most often, yeah, we see private equity a lot. Do we see strategics? Absolutely. Quite honestly, what we're seeing more of than what we've seen in the past are family offices. And, and family offices are really just, um, think high net worth individuals, high net worth families who have money just essentially sitting around and they have hired ex-private equity um, in. Uh, professionals to come in and manage their money. And part of that strategy is to purchase companies because there's such, um, there's such an amazing return that can be had um, through, through that whole mechanism. So yeah, um, I, I think one day we'll probably run into those more, but quite honestly, they're just not that active in, in, the, in the spaces that we're looking at right now. Think private equity, uh, definitely think family offices, especially. We're seeing a huge uptick uh, in family office activity over the past few years. Okay, that's great. Um, so if you have an, an industry strategic buyer, um, this, are you able to drive up the price by using a private equity company who might be interested? Very good observation. That's exactly right. We've got a client actually just signed an engagement yesterday that was adamant. We do not want to sell to private equity. And we were of the mindset, but if they're at the table making an offer, it can make a big difference. And that happened in a transaction a couple of years ago where there were a rights of first refusal on the line. The, the franchisor came to the table and uh, made an offer that we felt like was significantly lower than what it should have been. And then we went out and Brandon, tell us a little bit about what we did in that process and how private equity ended up driving it up. Yeah, absolutely. We, we So this is in the, um, in the QSR, uh, quick service restaurant space, which we've done several deals in that space as well. Um, but yeah, the, so the franchise um, or uh, was interested, made an offer, wasn't a particularly great one. We, we said, okay, well, we're going to market. And we went out to market, found an extremely active um, private equity group, um, made a just stellar offer. And we, we, we were thinking internally, no chance the franchise or comes back and takes this. I mean, they had the right of first refusal. It was theirs to, to not purchase. And they, come in, they came in and said, okay, yeah, we'll do that. Well, outside of us running that process, outside of us having that competitive nature in the process, the, I mean, just leaving tons of money on the table, um, you know, the, in the absence of a, of a competitive process, a buyer is just going to have their way every single time. If they've got some competition, it's amazing uh, how quickly they can find money that before they said was not there. Yeah, great point. Absolutely. So, yeah, so yes. Yeah, you're you're right. You know, even if you're not thinking private equity is your route, they can certainly be useful in helping and on the leverage side of the deal. Those are great points. Um, another question: If I'm a few years out from selling, what should I focus on to make sure I'm able to receive the most money for my business? It's a great point, Brandon. And I'll tag team on this. I think one of the first things to think about. Uh, is your financial situation from the, the standpoint of how professional it is. We're so blessed to be part of Car Riggs and Ingram because we know that clients that are working with them are going to bring financial uh, pri financials to the table that are on point, whether that's an audit, whether it's compiled, uh, whether they're getting a Q of E done. But Brandon's been on the receiving end of most of the financials, and it seems like you've received them in some interesting conditions at times. Yeah, think about the, uh, you know, the proverbial box of receipts um, showing up, you know, via FedEx, um, you know, so yeah, are there things you can do if, if you're a few years out? We actually love to hear uh, groups say, yeah, I'm a few years away from selling. That's perfect because you've got the time to get ready. Um, and I would say at a high level, sure, get your financials in order. If you're not already working with a CPA, get, get some professional in there looking at your numbers, making sure that all the reporting is right. But then also from, from just a general reporting standpoint, get it to where you can report on your customers, where you can report on sales by, um, by customer, by geography, by product, 
those things are, are huge and are absolutely going to be asked for when a buyer comes to the table. Um, so if you can go ahead and have those things set up, that's great. Also think about your management team. Think about who's next in line. If you're the primary driver of the business, who, who comes on board or who's the next one to step up if you are trying to step out? If you're not already in that situation, give that, give that some serious thought. Uh, if you don't have anybody, I would start grooming that person because if you ever want to exit this business, that, that you've spent your life creating and, and building, you're going to have to have the who's next already on deck and, and preferably already kind of running the business when you move into this. It's not essential. We've seen it done about every different way you can think of, but it just helps the process go smoother uh, at the end of the day. Okay, great. I have one more question that's come in here. Um, do you see companies giving management team incentives to stay on after the sale? That's uh, We've actually got that situation happening right now. We've got one that's looking to close uh, here at the end of the month. Uh, one of the things that was extremely um, important to the seller, to our client, was that his management team was taken care of. They've been with him, uh, you know, been loyal for many, many, many years, but they didn't have any ownership at all. He, he's the... Uh, uh, he, he's one of the sole owners. It's him and a couple of other um, gentlemen that don't actually work in the business. Uh, they're just the owners of the business. They don't operate in any way. We were able to negotiate a 15 percent um, uh, basically equity grant for um, the, the management team. So, yeah, it, it happens all of the time. And think about, too, you know, just beyond that element, if there are elements other than financial, you know, hey, what's my number that are important to you? Go ahead and make note of those, because a lot of that can be negotiated. A lot of that can be uh, worked into a deal. You're not going to get everything you want. It's not a genie in the bottle that you can just get every wish granted. But if there are things important to you, um, as an owner, you know, in addition to just, hey, I need to get this number for my business. If you want your employees taken care of, if you, if it's important that the name of the company sticks around, if it's important that this customer is taken care of, and so, I mean, all of those elements, you know, kind of make your, yourself a, a hit list of, okay, hey, here's my top five things. If I got to, if I got to structure the deal in, in the perfect way, this would be what it would look like. Definitely one of those is management team incentives, and we do see that quite often. Okay, great. One, one more question. Um, we'll uh, finish up with this question here. I like to really get the timing right. How can I know when it's best to sell? Do you guys have any alerts or anything like that that you send out? You know, that's a great question. And certainly being in manufacturing is extremely helpful. We don't send alerts out on that simply because we don't want anybody to feel like, oh, what well, now is the trigger time. Usually when it comes to selling, we like to see owners who are interested in selling on the upswing, that it's not, oh, I just had two terrible years, now I've got to sell. We like it when the story is, oh, wow, I've had two great years, this year looks like it's gonna be good too. Sometimes the owner feels like I'm going to get all all the way to the peak. And once it starts down, I want to try to let go right at the perfect timing. Uh, so what we tend to look at is how are your current business operations performing, your growth rate over the last couple of years. And then we're also happy to look at the, the market at any moment in time and help you determine how active the market is, how active acquirers are. And if both of those things are in alignment, it could be a very good time uh, to pull the trigger on that. But certainly we'll tell you up front uh, the truth about where you are and where the market is. Great, hey, that's great. Uh, Paul and Brandon, I thank you for the information you provided today. A lot of really great information um, through the webinar today. And we thank all the participants for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Um, we hope that you'll stay connected to CRI on all of the social media platforms. We'll go to the next slide there. There's how you can stay connected to CRI. And we appreciate your time today. And that concludes the webinar. <laughs>